You're listening to Hooked on Creek, a podcast celebrating the music, history, and fans of the legendary jam band Max Creek. I am your host, Corey Johnson, and you are listening to episode 48. Thank you for joining me on episode 48 of Hooked on Creek. If you love digging into the history of Max Creek, then I think you are really going to enjoy this episode. Coming up, I'm going to share a recent conversation I had with Peter Hurley. Peter is a huge fan of Max Creek, and he's been part of the Creek scene since 1978. In this episode, Peter talks about what it was like seeing Max Creek in the late 1970s and early 1980s. He also talks about seeing the band perform at venues like Mad Murphy's and the Shabu Inn during that time period, as well as his experiences attending the first three Camp Creeks. Peter covers a lot of interesting topics in our conversation, so I'm really excited to share this episode with you. But first, I want to quickly acknowledge I had a great time seeing Mike Gordon with Scott Murawski in Chicago on June 24th and 25th of this year. Both shows were incredible. On Sunday night, Scott invited me backstage to hang out with the band between the first and second sets, and then after that Sunday show, I got another opportunity to go backstage with the band. That night, Scott introduced me to Mike Gordon, and we chatted about my podcast. Later that night, Scott and his wife also brought me on the tour bus to hang out. Scott really went out of his way to make the experience extra special for me, so huge thanks to Scott. I had a great time. And I highly recommend you check out Mike Gordon's new album, Flying Games. It's really good. Okay, now back to today's episode. In the episode show notes, you'll find links to the music featured in this episode. And if you head over to hookedoncreek.com, you can read a full transcript of my conversation with Peter. All right, now let's get started. Peter Hurley, welcome to Hooked on Creek. Well, thanks for having me, Corey. Peter, I understand you've been listening to Max Creek for quite a long time. How long have you been a fan of Max Creek? Pretty much since 1978, so 45 years, I guess. Talk to me about what it was like to see Max Creek back in 1978. The first time we saw them, we we had been at a Grateful Dead concert three weeks before. We were out waiting for the gates to open at 3 a.m. outside the giant stadium, and there was a tape playing, and it was like, I just heard the music, and it was like, how oh, was this? You know, and he told me, my friend told me, he said, we got to go see these guys. And we went and saw them, and the big difference between them and everything else that was out there they were all southern rock bands all of them almost all or they were hard rock bands and then we come in and we were like wow a great piano player a female singer we were just blown away by the whole thing and you know and and it it continued i went up with a couple with like one friend the first time and we just after that by about a couple months later we were going with like a crew a couple carloads and stuff like that and um, that continued for a couple years that was really fun so you were Already a deadhead in 1978. Started. I started following the Grateful Dead in '76. I list, used to listen to my brother's albums going back as far as '73 or '74. So I was I was into the music for a long time and this style of music as well. Um, I just thought it to be very different, and um, it kind of spoke to me. You know, it, just the whole free flowing nature of the concerts, as well as you know, a lot of bands even back then. You go see them two nights in a bar, you're going to see the same songs. You know, the Max Creek back then, they were, they do two nights. They'd start at like 10, 15, 10, 30. They play a quarter to three in the morning. And so they do six plus hours of music over two nights. They had to have a lot of songs to play and they play three sets and stuff. And it was, you know, they were young, we were young. And um, the energy level of these things was crazy. And, you know, some of the places we were in were really tightly packed as well, but it was just all fun. If you don't mind me asking, how old were you roughly in 1978? I was 19. So you're a teenager, you're seeing the Grateful Dead, you, you're going to a show, you overhear somebody playing some music that sounds pretty good to you, and you find out it's Max Creek. Yeah, exactly. And so in 1978, Amy's in the band, you end up going to one of these Creek shows. Were they covering the Grateful Dead? Yeah, that was the thing. And it, there was, I guess, a little general criticism because, okay, they had their own music, but I think, like I was saying, they would play six hours plus music. And if they play a different song for two nights, that's six hours worth of different songs yeah they mixed it in but the other thing was when we first started seeing they also covered a lot of other bands um amy didn't sing any grateful dead songs for instance she sang barney Raitt, she sang grace slick she sang Joni mitchell and a couple other women singers whose names i don't um, remember now 
Her songs, the styles of her songs are very different than everybody else plays. You know, and they also had five people who sang at that point. So you never, ever knew it was coming. You know, as, as it as it has been for probably, you know, quite a while, it's usually just, you know, it's, it's John, Scott, Mark, one of the orders, and they just, you know, they, they rotate. But when they had five singers, you never know what was coming next. And that was kind of fun. You know, it was, it was always a kind of a surprise. And then a couple of years into seeing them, I started dating the girl in the band. After, you know, after I started seeing Amy, um, I was in the dressing room. And after a few months, I stopped being him when they were making the set list because I didn't want to, I didn't want to know. I was, I liked being surprised. So that was fun too. What venues are you seeing the band at this point in time? Where are you? Okay. Uh, well, Shibu Inn was the first place we went. Um, Mad Murphy's in Hartford was their, basically their home base. It was a very small place. Capacity, maybe 150. There'd be 400 people in there. You'd sit on windowsills. You'd stand on tables. Yeah, it was a party <laughs> for sure. So Creek is drawing this crowd in or are these people who just happened to just stumble across them? Oh, no. this I would say... I mean, this is my opinion. I mean, I, and somebody else may have a different opinion, but I would say 90% of the people that were at these shows were there to see them if it was in a club. I mean, if it was outdoors somewhere and it was, you know, there was like something else going on or something like they were like playing it like at UConn or, you know, someplace where there might be more in, in a public place where it was like, not like you, you just come there to see that. But I would say in a bar, yeah, you'd have to be really into Max Creek to, to even be inside some of these places because it was, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, and the, and the other thing was at that point, I mean, especially after 1980, I, I met a whole bunch more people. I met the band. You know, everybody knew me. It was just, you know, that's for a few years that that's what it was like when they played in Hartford, anyways. Because there were a lot of people from the town. I, I grew up in Simsbury, where some of the people in the band have lived in the past. A lot of people have lived in Farmington Valley here, where uh, John Ryder lives here. And it's the town I live in, Granby. Um, Amy lives here now. Some of the other members have lived in Simsbury and Granby, and they, some of them still live around here. Simsbury was sort of like a, almost like a home base for them. You know, and then they play in Hartford. Yeah, it was it was just a really um, it was a fun time and like you know, Creek's playing. And the great thing was, it was they'd always be in Connecticut, like at least for a couple of shows. Like you know, they'd play somewhere for two nights, so it'd be like, okay, when we can they be somewhere else, and then they'd be back in Connecticut. So you could always go see them, you know. And that was that was the great fun of it. So, well, take me back, you know, to the late seventies, early eighties. What is the band like? Because it sounds like you had some chances to um, interact with the band or meet the band. This is just a very general description. I don't get anything too personal. Like the dressing room scene was basically kind of silly. A lot of people cracking jokes and, you know, I mean, just sort of like, I wouldn't say they weren't taking it seriously, but they were just like, because when they got on stage, it was serious. They played great, but they weren't, you know, like all like intense and like, they were just so comfortable in what they were doing. You know what I mean? And they were so comfortable that the crowd would love it. You know what I mean? They, they were very relaxed as from, from what I, I pretty much noticed, you know, but it was all very fun. You know what I mean? Everybody, everybody in the band enjoyed it at that point. You know, because they were all young and nobody had kids yet and stuff like that, which, you know, kind of changes things as well. So it was just a bunch of, you know, pretty young guys, you know, playing music all the time. And then all their friends and all them now all their friends and they have a huge following in Providence. But it was Hartford and New Haven. Um, there was a venue in New Haven called Great American Music Hall. And it was just like the perfect site. It had a, a relatively high ceiling. There was rafters and stuff, but it wasn't like some of the places they played were like the ceiling was really low. Like Shibu Inn had a 10 foot ceiling. And they had they had national acts there for years, but it was at a ten foot ceiling, so that was kind of claustrophobic. But this place was beautiful. It was close, and I drive. I was working second shift. I dropped my friends off. We would go. We went every time they played there for, God, I mean, probably a year and a half, like every single time. That was one of our favorites there. So. Max Creek released their debut album in 1977. 1980, they had Rainbow come out. 1982, Drank the Stars. Did you get a sense that the band was really, at that point, trying to make something out of it? I know things. I just don't feel comfortable talking about it because I think it's a touchy subject. You know, people ask the question, you know, why didn't they ever do this? Why didn't they ever do that? And the way I look at it is, well, if they had, we wouldn't be able to see them all the time. What they've been doing is they've been making music here for 50 plus years, the three funk guys anyways. And they've been a huge part of people's lives at different times in their lives. And for most of mine, I met my ex-wife there. I met Amy there. I met a lot. 
yeah, I, I met I met a lot of people that I became involved with at Max Creek Show. <laughs> so, Peter, if I were to see you at a Creek Show, do you have a, a spot that you stand, or are you up front dancing? <laughs> yeah, about about three feet in front of John Ryder. <laughs> <laughs> Even now, I connect with people that that's why they go to shows. They go to shows to dance, and you know, when the music's not playing, they'll talk to people. But that's the main point. It doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. And there's quite a few of us actually, you know. And this is the same people that were doing it back then. Like I know some of these people are, are a little younger. Like I met them like the mid '80s or late '80s, but they're still doing it. And it's not a big group, but it's just people that have the same mindset. So it's, it's always great to see the people from way back when that are still doing what they were doing before. But yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it, it all started back then, though. I did want to mention the um, Camp Creeks that they played in Maine. Talked to anybody about Camp Creek before? Yeah. Later on, they moved up to upstate New York. They had one in somebody's backyard in, in here in Granby. I want to say 1981 or 82. And that was just a play in somebody's backyard, and they had woods, and people just slept there. But then they, they went to this place up in Maine. It was, it was on a farm. It wasn't really a working farm. It was just these guys that were on a farm. But they had a big barn with no walls. So it was outside, but it was inside. You know what I'm saying? So if the weather was bad, it was it was... The amount of people wasn't that great. It wasn't that big of a place, but it was it was magical because it was just, you know, we came out one year, I think it was 84. We came out after the show's Labor Day weekend. It was 32 degrees out. And the stars were like just there was millions of them because there's no ground light up there at all. But that was that was another um, sort of a milestone um, when they did the, those first two Camp Creeks up there. So you were at both of those first Camp Creeks? Oh, yeah. Well, there was, there was three of them. I was at the third one as well. But it was just it was just a really magical place, you know. It was out in the middle of nowhere, some farm. You know, a lot they did a lot of places, shows like that where they just, you know, they just play somewhere. It's like, why are we in this place? But there was magical things that happened at some of those shows. So Well, I'm curious, what are some of your favorite Max Creek songs? Okay. I kind of go like sort of era by era a little bit. So like early on, like Devil's Heart for one. I sort of have to go by by each member favorite one because other one otherwise it's you know, it's just, it gets too long. But I would say John Ryder's, like, Devil's Heart, one of the first songs I really liked by him. Wild Side, I'll Always See Your Face. I, I like songs that sort of, like, groove as opposed to rock. My favorite Scott songs are, like, The Field, Heartbeat, Emerald Eyes. December 17th this year in Providence, Scott actually wished me happy birthday during the intro to that. That kind of made my year. He never hadn't seen me there in, like, 20 years. He said, what are you doing here? And I said, it's all my birthday. He goes, so what, you want me to wish you happy birthday? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so he did. And, but he did it that end, which was really special because that's like, you know, that's my favorite song he played all night. So It's Peter Hurley's birthday. Everybody wish him a happy birthday. I was wondering why he was here. And I like, I like, um, like original songs by Mark. He doesn't have that many original songs. I kind of like them all. I mean, I think um, Fire and Brimstone, I think, is my, is my favorite that he wrote. Right now, he's a choir director here in, um, in next town over in Simsbury. And he used to always play piano or, or organ in, in church on Sundays, even after like being up till 3 a.m. playing shows. Do you have a favorite Max Creek show that you've attended? You, you mentioned the Camp Creeks earlier on. Is there one show that really stands out in your memory is like that was the one? I have a couple. The, one of them was there was a, um, a state-owned beach called Hammonasset State Park. You know, it's a big summer destination, you know. And one Tuesday afternoon, they opened up the beach for free because it usually costs like 10 bucks to park there or whatever. They had a Bruce Springsteen cover band, Max Creek, and a like three guy metal, you know, cover band. They played just basically you know, heavy metal songs. And there was 40,000 people there. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think the other one would be probably the first time I ever met Amy. It was in 1979. It was outdoor, maybe it was 80 before I started seeing her, somewhere in there. It was an outdoor show at the University of Connecticut, and they just did they did this opening like they'd play one song you know into another and then back into the same song that kind of thing, and that whole show was just like really really I, I remember that show a lot, and there was there was one more they played at a place called Connecticut College which is in New London Connecticut which is right around where I used to live down there, and it was Rob Fried's first show, and I'd known Rob Fried since I was like twelve him and my older brother were were best friends in high school. So he'd been in my house. I, you know, I'd seen him at other places, you know, like, so that was really cool. And that was also a really fun show because we got so many people that like lived around where we lived that would never like go anywhere to see Max Creek, but they would drive to London, which is like 10 minutes away. But we got to introduce like, I don't know, 30, 40 people to Max Creek. And then a bunch of them started seeing him as well. So that was really a cool thing. Well, talk to me about Rob Freed. I 
never got a chance to see the band with Rob Freed. What was it like to see him perform in Max Creek? Well, you know, he did have a neurological condition that really deterred him much later on. But back then, he was, you, you know, if you got bored at a show, you could just watch him. You know, he, he made faces. He just, you know, he, he was always like chewing gum really fast. And he, he played with a lot of toys. It wasn't just like, you know, drums. It was triangles. You know, he had a water whistle and any, any kind of, you know, cowbell, you know, any kind of percussion, hand percussion instrument you can think of. And on some of the earlier tapes now on the album, you can hear that, you know, him doing that. So and the other thing was he had so much stuff. You know, you have a, like a little tiny space and you want to set up, you know, 30 things, literally, you know, like all these stands with all this stuff. I'm like, you can't do that. <laughs> See, if he had enough space, you wouldn't believe the amount of things he would bring with him. He'd just pack his VW bus and, and he didn't have a drum kit either. There were certain shows, but like at Camp Creek, they had, they had a, they'd have a drum kit. At that, they, they'd also have guest drummers. People would come out and play, you know, the other drum stuff. Played a drum kit once in a while, but he just had an, an immense amount of like stuff. <laughs> you know, his, his whole house was full of it. Yeah. So you've had an opportunity to see all of the drummers, uh, I would imagine. Any reflections on you know how different drummers brought different things to the band over the years? I think that the best they they sounded was when they had two drummers, when it was Scott Allshouse and Greg Vasso, two vastly different drummers. Scott was a went to Berkeley, Berkeley School of Music in Boston, which is where you wouldn't believe how many musicians have gone there. <laughs> um, Tedeschi Trucks is is a perfect example. They both were going, that's where they met. Yeah, so he went to Berkeley, but he also went to Berkeley to be a sound engineer. In the early days when he was in the band, he would have to, he couldn't work Labor Day weekend that for two weeks because he was doing sound at the US Open in, at, uh, in New York City, the tennis tournament. But, and the, but Greg Vasso, was, he's a Connecticut guy. He was more of a, I'm paraphrasing here, coming from maybe more of like a garage band kind of a thing. Like he was playing drums probably when he was really young, you know, and he, and he, was ne- he never went to like a music college. But he had that like really solid rock drum beat. So you had this kind of jazzy guy with this guy, and it was a really nice mix. And they just sounded so great together. They really did. They were, I mean, to me, that was the best. Peter, are you a musician? Do you play music yourself? Amateur. I play. I play at open mics, <laughs> and I, I do play. The, I do play the guitar a lot. I, I'm, when I was younger, I didn't play for a really long time, and I started playing again maybe two years ago. And then a friend of mine. This woman I know like basically made me do her open mic one time and I started doing it other places and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it's almost tolerable now for people. So <laughs> Peter, what role does music have in your life? Live music is all important. I don't listen to a lot of recorded music for the simple reason, basically at this point that I'd have to choose. What am I going to listen to? If you go out and see live music, I mean, you know what songs are going to play at some point, but you don't know what you're going to hear. And to me, that's, that's what I really, um, I really enjoy. It is very important. It's also not just the music itself. It's the stories that are in the music, not, not the stories about going to shows, but just, you know, a lot of the lyrics to a lot of the music I listen to, it, it means a lot to me as well. I can relate to things, you know, and with Max Creek, it's like, sometimes I, I know, well, I know what that song was about, which is kind of cool as well. You know, you know, it's sort of a closing thing. It's like the, the thing that I haven't really talked about is the importance of having this kind of music to be able to go out and see from a personal perspective, from a, a psychological perspective to an extent you know you just you had a bad week you need to go out and, and these guys never ever disappointed you always got what you wanted to get when you went there you always wanted to be cheered up or whatever you needed to get from it from the music that night or whatever you always got it you know and i don't know how many other know other people feel like that but that's why i still do it because i still get it after all these years peter hurley it's been so great talking with you thank you for joining me on hooked on creek i really appreciate it, it was fun to uh rehash the past Big thanks to Peter Hurley for joining me on the podcast. I really enjoyed his stories about Max Creek and learning about his appreciation for the band over the years. So now to round things off, let's listen to a Max Creek live recording that dates back to 1978, the year Peter started going to Creek shows. This is Max Creek performing Devil's Heart into The Field into Signature live at the Shibu Inn in Willimantic, Connecticut on July 27, 1978.
That concludes episode 48 of Hooked on Creek. Again, huge thanks to Peter Hurley for coming on the podcast. If you're curious, during the introduction to this episode, I played a portion of Fire and Brimstone performed live by Max Creek at Cell Block 11 on December 31st, 1981 in Hartford, Connecticut. 
and during my conversation with Peter, I played a portion of High Flying Bird, performed live by Max Creek back on November 25th, 1978, at Mad Murphy's in Hartford, Connecticut. I played a portion of Rainbow, performed live by Max Creek at the Great American Music Hall in New Haven, Connecticut, back on January 7th, 1982. And I also played a portion of Emerald Eyes, performed live by Max Creek just last year on December 17th at the Met in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. You can find links to stream or download all the music featured in this episode in the show notes or on the Hooked on Creek website at hookedoncreek.com. And while you're on the website, go ahead and click the contact link and let me know what you think of this podcast. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in.